Hello, folks. Professor Rick Rapetti here. And today we are talking about the Socratics or the post Socratics. You've got Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, they're all this, you know, kind of Socrates and his two closest philosophers, his philosophical son and grandson, so to speak. Uh, and then all the other philosophers who are considered to have come after Socrates, even though a number of them lived around his time but they continued uh, you know, for several centuries. Um, but to, so this is like um, lecture two, post-Socratics lecture two of two, um, but it's really 2.1 because lecture two of two has three parts. The first part is about the cynics. That's this one. The next one, 2.1, uh, two will be about the Neoplatonists. And then 2.3, will be about the Christians or Christianity. All right, so, um, and these will be shorter lectures, but they will be short, maybe 10 minute or five minute video clips within this, where I'm gonna give you the opportunity to hear what some other people say about these topics, um, just to, you know, shake it up a little bit, change it up a little bit. Maybe you're tired of seeing my, my handsome face and hearing my wonderful voice. Um, but when I switch over, I have to, um, you know, go from uh, sharing my screen with um, PowerPoint to stop sharing the screen and then share the screen again, going directly to the YouTube link, which you will see the links are in my PowerPoint, so that when you look at the PowerPoint later on at your leisure, if you want, you can just go click on the link there and see these um, guest videos uh, that I'm going to bring in. The first one is a TED Talk. And I forget offhand, uh, each one of the 2.1 cynics, 2.2 neoplatonist and 2.3 Christianity, each one of these sub lectures that are together count as lecture two of two on the post Socratics has one video embedded in it. OK, so the one in this video uh, in my lecture, video, that is that we we go to is a TED talk, which is only a few minutes, maybe five minutes. All right. So um, let me share the screen so that the label at least comes up, the cover page for my PowerPoint so that you remember what it looks like. So there it is, post-Socratics, lecture 2.1 of two. So two point anything is part of two, okay? That's the system of numbering that I'm using here. I'm sorry, but uh, that's the way it goes. So next slide. Um, oh, actually, you know what? Let me turn that on because it has nice animation and I want you to see how cool that is. You know, create these wonderful effects just for you. Look at this. We're turning the page now from Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the three big ancient Greek philosophers, to those who came after it. Okay, the cynics. Um, and they were kind of right around the time of, of Aristotle. Um, and that's the link there. But now I said, uh, I'm not just going to click on that because when it switches screens, that you won't be able to hear the video, even if you see it. All right, so I'm going to end the share and then open up a, a new share. Which, be patient with me. It'll only take a moment. There it is. There's my TED Talk. And let me turn it on. Oops, what happened? So let's yeah, see that wasn't supposed to happen. Long email from your boss that you have oh, to finish before now. the big meeting starts in 10 Skip minutes. ads. I apologize for that. Oh, no, this is the wrong video. How'd that happen? I like Massimo Pigliucci. Uh, he's a friend of mine on Stoicism. But... Uh, in the 4th century BCE, a banker's son threw the city of Sinope into scandal by counterfeiting coins. When the dust finally settled, the young man, Diogenes of Sinope, had been stripped of his citizenship, his money, and all his possessions. At least, that's how the story goes. While many of the details of Diogenes' life are shadowy, the philosophical ideas born out of his disgrace survive today. In exile, Diogenes decided that by rejecting the opinions of others and societal measures of success, he could be truly free. He would live self-sufficiently, close to nature, without materialism, vanity, or conformity. In practice, 
This meant he spent years wandering around Greek cities with nothing but a cloak, staff, and knapsack, outdoors year-round, foregoing technology, baths, and cooked food. He didn't go about this new existence quietly, but is said to have teased passersby and mocked the powerful, eating, urinating, and even masturbating in public. The citizens called him a kion, a barking dog. Though meant as an insult, dogs were actually a good symbol for his philosophy. They're happy creatures, free from abstractions like wealth or reputation. Diogenes and his growing number of followers became known as dog philosophers, or cunicoi, a designation that eventually became the word cynic. These early cynics were a carefree bunch, drawn to the freedom of a wandering lifestyle. As Diogenes' reputation grew, others tried to challenge his commitment. Alexander the Great offered him anything he desired, but instead of asking for material goods, Diogenes only asked Alexander to get out of his sunshine. After Diogenes' death, adherents to his philosophy continued to call themselves cynics for about 900 years until 500 CE. Some Greek philosophers, like the Stoics, thought everyone should follow Diogenes' example. They also attempted to tone down his philosophy to be more acceptable to conventional society, which, of course, was fundamentally at odds with his approach. Others viewed the cynics less charitably. In the Roman province of Syria, in the second century CE, the satirist Lucian described the cynics of his own time as unprincipled, materialistic, self-promoting hypocrites who only preached what Diogenes had once actually practiced. Reading Lucian's texts centuries later, Renaissance and Reformation writers called their rivals cynics as an insult, meaning people who criticized others without having anything worthwhile to say. This usage eventually laid the groundwork for the modern meaning of the word cynic, a person who thinks everyone else is acting out of pure self-interest, even if they claim a higher motive. Still, the philosophy of cynicism had admirers, especially among those who wished to question the state of society. The 18th century French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau was called the new Diogenes when he argued that the arts, sciences, and technology corrupt people. In 1882, Friedrich Nietzsche reimagined a story in which Diogenes went into the Athenian marketplace with a lantern, searching in vain for a single honest person. In Nietzsche's version, a so-called madman rushes into a town square to proclaim that God is dead. This was Nietzsche's way of calling for a revaluation of values and rejecting the dominant Christian and Platonic idea of universal spiritual insights beyond the physical world. Nietzsche admired Diogenes for sticking stubbornly to the here and now. More recently, the hippies of the 1960s have been compared with Diogenes as countercultural rebels. Diogenes' ideas have been adopted and reimagined over and over again. The original cynics might not have approved of these fresh takes. They believed that their values of rejecting custom and living closely with nature were the only true values. Whether or not you agree with that, or with any of the later incarnations, all have one thing in common. They questioned the status quo. And that's an example we can still follow. Not to blindly follow conventional or majority views, but to think hard about what is truly valuable. Thinking critically about our institutions and way of life is more important than ever. Hone your newfound skepticism with these videos. All right. Let me stop that share. Now that's where uh, that video came in. Okay, and um, get back to PowerPoint for the rest of my lecture. Okay, good. Here we go. Okay, so cynics. Cynics philosophy is one of rejection. Um, 
rather than the Epicureans and the Stoics, I guess, by comparison, if you recall, had philosophies of acceptance, right? Accepting what you can't control, accepting powerlessness under the Roman Empire, domicide, right? The death of, you know, significant parts of your culture and self-rule and all that. The cynics just reject whatever the dominant values were, the norms, manners, moral norms, rules, behavior, laws, customs, all of that stuff. They reject society, they reject civilization, right? They wanna live kind of in nature, like hippies in a sense. And um, this statue is literally, um, supposedly historically accurate, depicting Diogenes. Uh, reports say that he enjoyed giving the middle finger to people um, as an insult to them. He uh, lived around the time, right? So he was born 11, 12, no, 13 years before Socrates was executed in 399, right? So he lived alongside Plato and uh, Aristotle. And in fact, the story goes that I forget whether it was Plato's Academy or Aristotle's University. I think it was Plato's Academy where Diogenes burst in upon a lecture, um, you know, made a mess, a ruckus, uh, eating food or whatever. I forget, just misbehaving or taunting the, the lecturer. I don't know if it was Plato. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, he lived around the same time as Plato and Aristotle. And uh, he allegedly lived in a barrel or a big ceramic jar um, at times, but he also lived in the street and slept in the, in the woods and on the side of the road and all sorts of things like that. He's from Sinope, and which is um, in Ionia, if you recall, that's where the empiricists were from, which is part of an ancient Anatolia, which is now modern day Turkey. He counterfeited a lot of money. He got caught, he got exiled. That was in the video that you just saw. And he wanders about uh, the rest of the Greek world because he was exiled, kicked out, homeless with uh, you know a sheet that he wore, a stick, a walking stick, a staff, and a knapsack bag, whatever you want to call it, and sometimes lived in a barrel. <laughs> he performed his biological functions openly, as you saw in the cartoon video. I won't remind you what those biological bodily functions were, but they were the kinds of things that are normally not performed in public because he you know, rejected social norms. He barked insults at, uh, I put normal, norm with a hyphen, not just because it was at the end of the line, but just to hyphen, uh, to put the hyphen in there, I hyphenated it to highlight or emphasize what the word normal is based on. Normal means in compliance with the norm. Right. And what's the norm? It's just like the average or what most people do. Right. Whether it's a written rule or just a, a rule that happened to have taken root in a culture. Right. But he would bark insults at all the normal people who were observing the rules wherever he was. And, yeah, there's a statue of Alexander the Great. Um, Let me pause for a moment to remind you, Alexander the Great conquered the known world from all of Europe and North Africa down, I don't know how far into Ethiopia, most of the Middle East and Asia Minor, all the way into India, right? Alexandrian Empire with Alexandria's cities named after Alexander all over the place. Um, at a very young age, I think he was 30 or something, or 31 when he died, something like that. So the most powerful person in the world at the time, you know, you, you saw some of that in the cartoon video, but he had heard of this Diogenes character who couldn't be bribed, right? He couldn't be bought. You know, he didn't care about anything. And Alexander went to test him, right? Offered him anything in his vast kingdom. And he told him, could you, yeah, sh thank you. Could you step out of my way, please? Thank you. Right. <laughs> it was pretty risky of him speaking to the emperor like that. Um, because he lived like a dog, 
you know, urinating and defecating and sleeping and spitting and farting and barking at people all in public, right? He was called a dog philosopher and the word kinikos means something like dog-like. So the word kinik, cynic, the K and the C often change pronunciations when the word moves from one language to another. The dog philosophers, the cynics, as they came to be known in English eventually. And they were all social critics, not just him. He had a whole bunch of followers after, you know, people realized he was free and he preached freedom, you know, freedom, just cast off all the societal rules and be free. Live in nature, right? And the Stoics believed that in living in accordance with nature. So they had, they, they were influenced by him, only they, as it said in the video, wanted to get rid of the his oppositional attitude toward people who don't live in nature like a dog, right? But to rather live, they wanted to live in accordance with human nature, right? Um, I heard a lecture about them by Massimo Pilucci, actually, the guy that we accidentally saw in the wrong YouTube that came up. Um, uh, I think he has a book, How to Live Like a Stoic, or no, How to Think Like a Stoic, or something like that. I was just listening to it earlier today where um, he said that the idea that the Stoics and the Cynics had, well, he didn't mention the Cynics, I'm mentioning them because they both had the same idea, was to live in accordance with nature. And as human beings, you have a human nature. And what is human nature? It's what Aristotle said it is. You're a rational social animal. So you have biological needs as an animal, but you also have cultural and social needs as a social animal. And you need to cultivate and use your noodle, your thinking cap uh, as human beings, right? We can't just live like tigers, as Massimo put it, or lions, right? We can't survive just on our speed and our strength. We have to use our brains to survive, right? So living in nature is not necessarily um, him going out and just, you know, sleeping in the woods, right? Uh, it's, it's more like living in accordance with human nature, or at least that's the direction the Stoics took his idea, I would say. Okay, rejecting all possessions. Uh, the Stoics didn't go that far, but they where they went with that to compare, you know, you, you studied the Stoics already in a previous lecture, right? Um, wealth is not necessarily the key to happiness and it falls under the part of their distinction, if you recall, between what you can and cannot control. You can try to amass wealth, you can even amass great fortune, but you can't control whether or not the world lets you keep it, right? So I think the Stoics have a little bit more refined, the Diogenes and his followers, the cynics, were like wandering, homeless, possessionless individuals. The Stoics weren't against possessions. They were against attachment to them, right? And I think there's a refinement there in Stoicism. Um, rejected reputation, but the Stoics also thought, uh, well, you know, possessions and reputation are things that, what did they call them? Preferred, what? preferred indifferent or indifference, right? Things you should prefer, you do prefer, but if you don't get them, it's out of your control. You do it as long as you do what you can to try to get them and keep them, but you know, ultimately it's out of your control. And if you lose them, you should be indifferent to it. You can do all the greatest things in the world to cultivate the best reputation. And, you know, some wicked people can destroy your reputation in ways that you can't control, right? So that's the Stoics. I'm comparing the Stoics and the Cynics here. Um, now, speaking of reputation, oh, I should have waited. I didn't realize that I already spoke about him telling Alexander the Great to get out of his way, right? <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Okay, so yes, there's that story about him. Um, I'm not sure if Nietzsche made it up or if it's a historical story about Diogenes because I've read both versions of it. But he wandered around, and the video didn't emphasize this, he wandered around in the daytime with a lit lamp, peering, searching, and people would ask him, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And he, he would ignore them until enough people got angry at him and say, what are you looking for? And stop him and get in front of him and he'd say, I'm looking for an honest man, right? Okay, so there's a message in that, that he thought most human beings are dishonest. Right, and I guess there's an, another implication that if you're all entangled in society, you might have reasons to be dishonest. Well, just certainly think about if you're entangled in politics, right? 
unfortunately, uh, it seems to be a kind of truism that most politicians can't be effective if they're honest. I don't know if that's really accurate, but that seems to be a widespread belief. All right, so four reasons for the dog name, right? Cynics means dog philosophers originally, right? So the first is that they are indifferent to their way of life. They eat and make love and everything else in public. They go barefoot. They sleep in tubs and roads and in the woods, right? So they live like dogs in a way and they act like dogs and they have the attitudes of dogs. That's all in the first reason for the dog name. Second is, well, um, it kind of follows from the first one that the dogs are shameless, right? They don't have shame. They're not embarrassed when you see dogs doing these things in front of everybody else. They, they have no shame whatsoever, right? It's just not on their radar, right? Why? Why? Because they don't have a kind of moral compass like, like human beings do. Third reason, dogs are good guards, right? They're very loyal, right? And the dog philosophers guard their philosophy, right? Get out of my way, Adam. Alexander, you can't bribe me. I, I'd rather risk my life telling you to get out of my way than let you bribe me. All right, so they, they're very loyal to their philosophy. And like a real dog, they can tell friend or foe pretty well, right? And um, they'll bark at their enemies, but they'll be very nice. They'll wag their tails when their friends are around. And for Diogenes and the other cynics, Friends are people who are suited to philosophy and the care of the soul. So they were influenced, almost everybody around the time and after Socrates was influenced by Socrates, Socrates' model life as a philosopher who said the unexamined life is not worth living, right? You need to use your reason as your primary guide to life, not your emotions. Not that there's no room for emotions, but and to find out what matters, how you should live your life, what's the most important things in life, what really matters, what are your values, what's your deepest self, know thyself. Socrates seems to be following that command from the god Apollo outside the temple of Apollo where the oracle said, no man is wiser than Socrates, right? So the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Cynics, they all were Socratics. They were post-Socratics or contemporaries of Socrates, but you know their importance comes after his in the history of philosophy. So they're, in a sense, post-Socratics. They were all followers and lovers of Socrates. Um, in fact, I think Diogenes, it might have been Diogenes who criticized Plato for not really understanding Socrates well enough. If it wasn't him, it was one of the other post-Socratics. Okay, and speaking of other later post-Socratics, they influenced many later philosophers and society, right? The next generations of the cynics, however, a couple of generations later with all their followers, they lasted for several hundred years, the school of cynicism, right? It was a kind of um, loose body of people, you know, one generation after another of teachers and followers and so on, right? They were criticized for using the doctrine um, like it said in the video, um, for, but, for, but more like an excuse for them being pigs, you know, for being like into sex, drugs, and rock and roll as um, the hippies were, right? But not really following any of the more serious part of the philosophy, right? Um, they enjoyed wealth and fame and everything else that the, the original cynics uh, let go of right? And like you saw in the video, later writers use the term to accuse them of being hypocrites, right? Of having a narrative, speaking a certain philosophy, but not really living it the way that Diogenes and the first round of his followers, at least if not a few rounds, actually were not hypocrites. For criticizing everybody else, as if they, everybody else is guilty of being deceitful. Well, you know, Diogenes with the lamp looking for an honest man. So if there's nobody who's really honest other than cynics themselves, right, then they believe that everybody else is dishonest. If you're dishonest, that means that you say you're doing something for a good reason. You're trying to help someone else. You really care about them or whatever, but really is only ultimately some selfish, self-interested 
egotistical or narcissistic reason why you really do the things that you do. And that sense of the term cynicism still carries forward today, right? And, but also this is another critic criticism of the cynics that they criticize others without offering any positive or constructive ideas of their own. Like no matter what anybody ever comes up with, they just try to shoot it down, right? Any kind of institution or principle or procedure or behavior or character trait or argument or philosophy, right? They just criticize everything. And eh, no, that's not, you know, it's a cynical attitude. That's why the word as an adjective nowadays really does originally go back to them, right? As it said in the video, Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau, liked Diogenes. Uh, he also believed that society, like I think it's in art, technology, and I forget what else, um, education and high culture, all those things spoiled human beings, right? Um, the bourgeois values, right? And he advocated like the noble savage, which was like Diogenes, right? Um, that's literally a phrase that I think Rousseau used, that man living in nature, that's true man, not man living in society, right? So I'm just amplifying on all the things that were in the video. Nietzsche loved Diogenes because, you know, he gave everybody, the, <laughs> you know, pardon me for that gesture, but uh, Diogenes just called people out on the baloney or the BS, right? Uh, I think one off topic or, you know, offhanded, you know, gesture or remark is enough for one video um because that that's that was the way that Nietzsche was um yeah and then he tells the story about I don't know if it was Diogenes in his story I don't remember this part of Nietzsche but the story in Nietzsche is that some madman runs into town like Diogenes uh yelling out God is dead and this this phrase from Nietzsche God is dead was a way for Nietzsche to criticize uh, the Greco-Roman Western philosophy and Western Christianity or Judeo-Christian values. So almost all the values and norms of Nietzsche's European society at his time in the 1800s is just the outgrowth of the Greco-Roman and Catholic tradition in the West, in Europe, right? Which Nietzsche called the whole thing into question, kind of like Diogenes. God is dead, right? Like the whole thing is, is a farce right? Um, dramatic, just like Diogenes, you know, cursing at people in the street. Um, so yeah, the modern term, someone's cynical, they're pessimistic about everybody else's motives. So here's a little one from the a cartoon about the cynics handbook, right? So this is guidance for you. If you see light at the end of the tunnel and people tell you, no, it's darkness now, but there's light up ahead. There's always light at the end of the tunnel, or I see light at the end of this tunnel. The cynic would say, yeah, it's probably an oncoming train. You better get out of the way. All right, so let me end the screen share and um, let you see my beautiful face. And um, I think that's all I have for the, uh, the cynics. Um, this is a relatively short one, but we've got two, three altogether, two more relatively short ones coming. So I'll see you in the next one which is post-Socratic's lecture 2.2 of two, um, Neoplatonists. See you soon.